board member of the Australian Borderline Personality Disorder Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you all to this online forum um, known as BPD and Trauma um, with Associate Professor Satya Rao. I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne, and I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the, of the land on which I live, and also from where you may be viewing this. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also wish to acknowledge the experiences of those living with BPD and those who support them. Their voices are essential to the development of our work. We recognise their vital contribution at all levels and value the courage of those who share this unique perspective for the purposes of learning and growing together to achieve better outcomes for all. As a bit of an introduction, I'd be really interested in where everyone uh, is joining us from today. So if you'd like to invite you to share this in the chat box. Um, whilst that's coming through, a very quick introduction to the foundation, which was launched in 2013. The foundation is the peak body for borderline personality disorder in Australia. We're a group of volunteers passionate in developing an open dialogue between consumers, carers, clinicians, and researchers to encourage a positive culture around the mental illness known as borderline personality disorder. We're a registered charity and all donations are tax deductible. BPD Awareness Week in Australia is the first week in October. And so far this week, we have had a number of events, both online and of course, we're permitted in person, plus a very active engagement via social media. As part of our activity, we host an annual conference around Australia and coordinate a group of interested organisations and individuals to organise a BPD awareness campaign each year. However, this year, like in so many other facets of our lives, we've had to adjust to the current circumstances. So our annual conference and awareness week have morphed into a week with numerous events, uh, the majority online. So this year's theme builds upon the 2020 campaign, Flipping the Script, Changing the Narrative on BPD, which identified a gap in treatment programs, addressing a person's complex sense of self, self-stigma and negative self-narrative. The message for this year's BPD Awareness Week is discover creative wellbeing. It aims to encourage thinking beyond the conventional concept of therapy to consider creative therapies and explore creative ways to promote positive outcomes. For example, for people experiencing the symptoms of BPD, how can we access to creative methods of expression and communication be increased? Supporting visual and audio practices, peer support, and thinking outside standard verbal therapeutic approaches. For supporters, carers, and families, how can they encourage and instill more creative thinking and ways to approach well-being? And for those of us working with um, people living with BPD, what can be done to support thinking outside the box in terms of treatment practices and methods? How can more creative thinking and ways to approach wellbeing be encouraged? This could include, for example, exploring expression and communication in creative ways such as songwriting, music, poetry, letter journal writing, and nonverbal communication such as prompt and strength cards. The Foundation has a purpose-built website where we make available all of our resources for free download. All we ask is that you don't edit these resources um, and that you specify the source, um, but they are there to be used. I'd really like to acknowledge the work of our graphic designer, Marley Jewell, who is a lived experience advocate who combines her artistic skills, life experience of having BPD and her advocacy in such a unique way. I hope that gives you just a brief overview of the Foundation's work and would now like to hand over to our President, Rita Brown, to introduce our guest speaker. Thanks, thanks Alison. And uh, just looking at the places that people are, are coming, um, what lands they're, they're attending from, and we've certainly got a, a wide variety from around Australia. I know we had a couple of people from overseas registered, but it, looks like they might, might be watching the link at a, a later time. So just some quick housekeeping. I'll be facilitating today's session. So please post any questions into the uh, chat, chat box and I'll pick up on any themes and ask Sathya to respond.
And I think everyone's pretty aware these days of Zoom etiquette, but please keep your mics muted. And as uh, Alison said, this session will be recorded and uploaded and we'll send a link to you as soon as you can. So we're honoured today to um, hear from Associate Professor Satya Rao, who's the Clinical Director of Spectrum, uh, which is the Personality Disorder Service in Victoria. His bio is available on the website, so I won't repeat it here, but nevertheless, he is a really passionate advocate for every, uh, everyone impacted in some way by BPD, for those with lived experience, for carers, supporters, family, and also for clinicians. So thanks very much for joining us, Satya. Thank you, Rita, for that very kind introduction. And a good afternoon to everybody. Uh, can all of you hear me properly? Uh, Rita, you can hear me? And can you also see the slides, Rita? Uh, Rita, can I, can you give me some feedback? Yes, we can hear and see. Oh, perfect. Okay. So let me get started. Um, so Rita asked me to talk about uh, borderline personality disorder and uh, a complex trauma and its uh, relationship. Um, I should say that uh, probably this is the talk that I really have sweated the most about this year. Because I do about a couple of talks every week. Uh, but when Rita asked me to talk about this topic uh, to an audience of the Australian BPD Foundation, that's really challenging. Before I get started, uh, let me also begin uh, by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who may be present at this meeting today. Also acknowledge uh, people with lived experience of emotional distress, trauma, neurodiversity, and mental health challenges, their families and carers and supporters. I also pay my respect and my thanks to the mental health workforce, consumer, carer, and clinical for the important work they do and the support they pro provide to people and their families across Australia. So I also want to acknowledge that uh, this is the uh, BPD Awareness Week. Now, what's the relationship between trauma and borderline personality disorder. Now, what I'm going to be talking is uh, highly, highly controversial. And uh, I'm aware that uh, there are very many per perspectives uh, on this issue. And all perspectives, in my opinion, are valid. And even if they're not supported by science, they're still valid because science around this uh, uh, topic and issue is still emerging. And I don't think the last word has been said yet. Uh, I'm also aware that uh, any discussion about trauma and its consequences is a very emotive issue and can inadvertently uh, hurt or invalidate uh, some of us. Uh, it can invalidate consumers, families, carers, or clinicians. Just wanted to acknowledge that. And also wanted to give you a bit of a trigger warning, a caution that uh, a lot of the things that I'm going to be talking about uh, would uh, involve uh, information about trauma. Feel free to uh, mute or reduce the uh, the volume if you want to take a break. Satya, can I just ask you to move your mic, I think, a little bit away from your face? We're getting a little bit of um, noise of the air going past your mic. Uh, what about now? That's much better for me, yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Now, I am also likely to leave you with more questions uh, than answers and probably more confusion than clarity. Uh, this is the state of science uh, today with respect to trauma 
complex trauma, personality, and trauma-related disorders. Okay, so I'm gonna put a few slides about the controversies and questions, and um, and I'll I'll address some of them in in, in more detail uh, with further slides. Of course, I won't have time to address all of them, but uh, we'll try and pick it up, pick up some of the discussion uh, later on. So, first question is: Can we get rid of the name uh, borderline personality disorder? I really, really wish we can. I hate the name borderline personality disorder. I don't like it at all. Uh, unfortunately. What I'm aware is that the changing the name of borderline personality disorder needs to be done at the level of the World Health Organization. And uh, may all the countries around the world need to cooperate and agree. It's a long process. It doesn't mean to say that we can't uh, make the start uh, in Australia, we certainly can. Is borderline personality disorder a trauma disorder? Uh, that is quite controversial. And I've got a few slides coming up. Does trauma cause borderline personality disorder? Again, uh, it's a controversy. We'll talk about it. Can we have borderline personality disorder without trauma? Certainly can. Uh, about 10% of the patients with borderline personality disorder do not report any trauma history. That may or may not may have, uh, mean that they have not experienced trauma. Just going by the report in, in research, people don't seem to report, 10% of the people don't seem to report history of trauma. Can we call borderline personality disorder as a complex trauma disorder? Certainly some, uh, some clinicians and some consumers have um, embraced this name. Can we, also, can we also call it as complex PTSD? Yep, yeah, um, that has also been uh, used, but again, this area is controversial. Um, are Borderline personality disorder, the F is a, sp a spelling mistake. Borderline personality disorder and complex PTSD are one and the same. Uh, the, the jury is out, but the current understanding is that these two are two different disorders. Further controversies. Uh, what is the difference between borderline personality disorder with PTSD? and complex, uh, complex PTSD. That's, uh, uh, that's a highly, highly controversial area. We really don't have clarity around it in science. Can PTSD, complex PTSD, borderline personality disorder occur in a continuum, uh, one leading to the other uh, as uh, a person grows older? Uh, doesn't seem to be so. Can PTSD and complex PTSD co-occur? At least according to the classificator system, it can't. And uh, I've got a couple of slides later on to show you why not. Can BPD and complex PTSD co-occur? Theoretically, yes, but uh, uh, it's going to be very hard for any clinician to tease out the two. Can we treat complex PTSD with borderline personality disorder treatments? That certainly is what we are doing currently. Uh, so as of today, uh, see, I work at Spectrum. As of today, any, uh, anyone uh, is referred to us, uh, is assessed, and 99% of the people who come to us at Spectrum have a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. Right now, according to the official classification system, we are not able to yet make a diagnosis of complex PTSD, and we can do so from the 1st of uh, January 2022 in a few months time. But as of today, we can only make a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. And um, now I'm, I'm sure uh, if we apply the, the new classification, uh, a sizable number of our patients will get a diagnosis of complex PTSD instead of borderline personality disorder. However, the treatment that we have been doing uh, in the last 20 years, which, which is psychological treatments, uh, with which about 80% of our uh, patients tend to go into remission and a significant number of them recovery. All of them get the BPD specific treatments. So what I'm trying to say is that right now we treat probably a group of patients who have either BPD or complex PTSD, but the treatments that we give are uh, the same BPD treatments. And that seems to work in majority of the cases. Now, Satya, yeah. sorry, I'm um, just wondering if you can use, 
You're dropping, fading in and out a little bit. Just move that mic a little bit closer again. Okay. Is this better now? Um, if someone could give me some indication. Is it better now? That, that sounds better. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Uh, feel free to give me feedback again, Rita. It is not working. Yep. Okay. So did people hear what I said so far or do you think I need to repeat? Rita? We could hear. Okay, good. Okay, so the the next question is, are there evidence-based treatments for complex PTSD? Uh, if you have to strictly go by the new diagnosis of complex PTSD, we don't have any evidence-based treatments yet. We have been using the treatments that are available for borderline personality disorder, and anecdotally, it seems to help. Now, can we differentiate between PTSD and complex PTSD? We certainly can. Uh, I'll talk to you more about it. And uh, of course, I told you that uh, differentiating between borderline personality disorder and complex PTSD is possible, but it is going to be challenging. Then, now does EMDR work for BPD or complex PTSD? Still, the evidence is very limited. Uh, and um, I know that uh, there are a uh, few clinicians who have developed expertise to work with the trauma aspects of uh, BPD or complex PTSD, but uh, the, the evidence is still uh, inadequate. Now, so this, is, this, is a, this again is a different way of looking at that controversial question. Uh, is BPD or complex PTSD a normal response to an abnormal situation during childhood? Yes, it certainly seems to be so, uh, but there are, again, some controversies. So does resilience prevent BPD complex PTSD? Again, this is something which we need to research more. And are the genetic factors responsible for BPD or complex PTSD? We don't know about complex PTSD, at least for borderline personality disorder. We know that 50% of the contribution for causation seems to come from genetics. Then why do some people develop PTSD or complex PTSD after exposure to trauma and others don't? We don't know the answer. Probably resilience, but we don't know the answer. Uh, it is still not entirely understood why some people develop certain mental, mental symptoms after traumatic events while others don't, even broadly speaking. Now, again, the, the very definition of trauma uh, is fraught with uh, controversies. If you had to go by the DSM, the DSM definition of trauma requires actual or threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violence. Stressful events not involving an immediate threat to life or physical injury, such as psychosocial stressors, are not considered as trauma in this definition. The trauma can be single or multiple trauma can occur during childhood or adulthood or both during childhood and adulthood. Now, when we come to the definition of complex trauma, complex trauma, uh, that, that phrase is used to describe events of a long lasting, invasive and primarily interpersonal nature trauma of interpersonal nature. Uh, usually we're talking about uh, childhood abuse, neglect, or intimate partner violence, uh, sexual assaults, uh, exploitation, uh, medical trauma, refugee trauma, torture, genocide, etc. As opposed to a single incident trauma, such as, for example, road traffic accident. Now, if you look at the prevalence of trauma, um, Adverse childhood events, including trauma, is a very common experience worldwide, uh, with some estimates suggesting that a third of the general population may be impacted by trauma. So there was a large representative sample of uh, nearly 70,000 adults from 24 countries, and uh, about 70% of the respondents in that study reported a traumatic events. But it's possible that uh, the people who responded to the study uh, were selective. 
Now, there are other studies which show that globally, the prevalence of reported childhood sexual abuse varies from 2% to 62%. And in high income countries, the annual prevalence of physical abuse ranges from 4 to 16%. And approximately 10% of children are neglected or emotionally abused. So trauma is extremely common uh, in our world. Now, how, do, how does trauma link with uh, uh, mental health or mental health conditions? Most people who have been abused during childhood do not develop uh, or any BPD or any other psychiatric disorders. So that is slightly um, encouraging. Now, there's another, another study which has suggested that nearly 30% of uh, incidences of mental health disorders in patients may be associated with adversities experienced in their childhood. This we are talking about general psychiatric disorders. Now, large-scale studies of childhood uh, sexual abuse uh, in general population shows that 80% of the adults, uh, children when they grow up to adulthood, uh, do not develop any psychological uh, problems that can be diagnosed. About 20% of them develop a range of mental health conditions, including borderline personality disorders, psychosis, schizophrenia, bipolar disorders, etc. So uh, trauma is very, very common. Um, now the, the trauma during childhood is also extremely common. And uh, when you follow, follow up those children to adulthood, it seems like 80% of them do not develop psychiatric problems, about 20% of them develop a range of psychiatric and psychological mental health conditions, and BPD is one of them. So what it shows is that uh, trauma does not specifically cause a borderline personality disorder. However, in borderline personality disorder, trauma is extremely common. Now, um, if you're looking at the uh, prevalence of uh, borderline personality disorder, we know that it is 1%. Um, if you're looking at uh, prevalence of post-traumatic stress disorder, it ranges from 39 to 5.6%. If you're looking at the prevalence of complex PTSD, again, the data is very small right now, only a few studies, because the diagnosis is still new. Uh, the prevalence is anywhere between 0.5 to 7.7% in general population. However, uh, if, you, if you study the people who are in mental health treatment, about a third of them, third of the adults, seem to have a, a diagnosis of complex PTSD, which is very significant. And if you're looking at the same data for borderline personality disorder, we know that 20% uh, of uh, uh, mental health patients seem to have a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. Now, complex PTSD was, is co was comorbid with approximately half of women diagnosed with borderline personality disorder study. And uh, borderline personality disorder was comorbid with only approximately 8% of cases diagnosed with complex PTSD. So this is where we are able to tease out complex PTSD from borderline personality disorder to some extent. Now, uh, it's uh, interesting that uh, until 1980, uh, we did not include borderline personality disorder or PTSD uh, in a formal way in the classificator system. And uh, so if it is 1980, we're talking about uh, about 40 plus years of experience with these two disorders. And you, you know that both, until now, the, these two disorders continue to be controversial, uh, BPD more controversial than uh, PTSD. But clearly more research is needed to understand the interrelationships of PTSD, complex PTSD, and borderline personality disorder, uh, as well as the differences between these disorders. Now, just a very quick uh, update on uh, PTSD diagnosis. Uh, as you're aware, PTSD is post-traumatic stress disorder, and it is comprised of three symptom clusters, which include re-experiencing of trauma, the here and now, and uh, this is flashbacks, reliving experiences, and avoidance of uh, trauma reminders, you know, acute triggered uh, anxiety, panic, uh, dissociations, a persistent sense of uh, current threat 
that is manifested by exaggerated startle and hypervigilance. So this, these are the three sets of uh, symptoms that is required to make a diagnosis of uh, PTSD, according to DSM. Now, complex PTSD is a old concept. It's about, again, about 30, 40 years old. Uh, it was initially introduced by a person called uh, Judith Herman. Um, it was. It did not enjoy the status uh, of a diagnosis in the official classificator system until now. Uh, from the 1st of January next year, as I was telling you earlier on, one can make a diagnosis of complex PTSD in the new ICD-11. DSM-5 still does not uh, include complex PTSD as an official diagnosis. Now, what is complex PTSD? Complex PTSD is PTSD plus disturbances in self-organization. So to make a diagnosis of complex PTSD, a person needs to qualify criteria for a diagnosis of PTSD in the first instance. You know, remember the through three sets of symptoms uh, I discussed earlier on. So they need to have those three sets of symptoms. So they have PTSD, plus they need to have these three uh, 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 symptom difficulties, which is emotion regulation difficulties, negative self-concept, and relational difficulties. So PTSD symptoms plus these three symptoms um, lead to a diagnosis of complex PTSD in ICD-11. Uh, and, and, and as you can see, so if you're talking about emotional regulation difficulties, negative self-concept, relational difficulties, these are symptoms which you also see in bodily personality disorder. So that's where the problem comes up. Now, in ICD-11, an individual can receive either a diagnosis of PTSD or complex PTSD, and obviously they can't get both the diagnosis. Now, as of now, we when we make a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder, in uh, about uh, half of the patients, we also give a diagnosis of PTSD in addition to borderline personality disorder because we call it as comorbidity. So is that different from complex PTSD? And if so, how is it different? We don't know. So this is another way of looking at it. A complex PTSD is characterized by those three uh, uh, problems I told you about, the emotional dysregulation, interpersonal problems, and negative self-concept negative, uh, there's a lot of self-loathing. Now, these three symptoms plus PTSD will get you a diagnosis of complex PTSD. Now, so uh, when you're talking about complex PTSD, we're talking about a distinct group of individuals with severe uh, psychosocial impairment and uh, who were exposed to multiple forms of trauma, mostly of an interpersonal nature and mostly during uh, developmental years. So this is how uh, the, uh, the ICD-11 complex PTSD uh, diagnosis would look like, uh, which I've explained to you, so I'm not going to repeat it again. Now, this is a way of trying to uh, understand the differences between BPD and complex PTSD. Now, in the ICD-11, that is what is going to be the official classificator system from the 1st of January. And uh, just a reminder that although we clinicians use DSM-5, uh, even in Australia, when it comes to coding, uh, coding uh, is the data which goes to all the departments of uh, health and also to the insurance companies, that they use ICD-11, because that's a global, globally accepted diagnostic system. Now, in ICD-11, uh, you can make complex PTSD diagnosis, but you can't make a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder because the diagnosis in our personality disorders in uh, ICD-11 has changed. You will have to call it as personality disorder borderline pattern in ICD-11. Now, when it comes to symptoms, now the self-concept in borderline personality disorder is unstable. Self-concept in complex PTSD is severe, but stable negative uh, over a period of time. We're talking about persistent self-loathing and negative self-concept. Now, uh, 
in borderline personality disorder, you may see rapid engagement followed by ups and downs and idealization devaluation of relationships. Uh, in complex PTSD, there's more avoidance of relationships and they have difficulty maintaining relationships. Now, suicidality and the non-suicidal self-injury uh, is a signature symptom of borderline personality disorder and which is much less in complex PTSD. Now, uh, presence of uh, history of trauma is, is essential to make a diagnosis of complex PTSD, but you don't need that uh, in borderline personality disorder. Now, trauma is a risk factor in BPD and it is essential in complex PTSD. When it comes to treatments, we know that uh, borderline personality disorder, we have lots of evidence-based treatments, uh, such as DBT, MBT, etc. Now, complex PTSD, we still don't have evidence-based treatments. Of course, uh, exposure treatments, cognitive behavior therapy, EMDR, trauma-focused uh, treatments, and some psych psychodynamic treatments have been uh, tried. So trauma-informed care is absolutely essential in uh, complex PTSD. Uh, in borderline personality disorder, is again, it is essential, especially if there is trauma history. And when it comes to consumer patient acceptability, borderline personality disorder is, uh, is not an acceptable diagnosis, but given the stigma it carries even with the name. And complex PTSD seems to be a somewhat more acceptable diagnosis. If you're looking at group treatments, we do have group treatments for uh, BPD, but we don't have any group treatments yet for complex PTSD. Okay. Now, just getting back to trauma. So usually when you're talking about complex trauma, complex trauma results in complex PTSD and single trauma results in PTSD. Single trauma such as road traffic accident, for example, leads to PTSD. So that's the common understanding. However, some individuals with complex trauma can develop PTSD alone and not complex PTSD. And conversely, some individuals with a single incident trauma can develop uh, complex PTSD. We see this in uh, uh, pain clinics and chronic uh, pain uh, syndromes as well as people who have had work over injuries going on to develop not just PTSD, but a complex PTSD. Now, let's focus our attention on borderline personality disorder. So uh, borderline personality disorder, is it caused by childhood trauma and the biological factors don't play a role, but that's highly controversial. Uh, this is the paper I was talking to you by uh, Judith Herman. Um, she kick-started uh, this discussion about uh, borderline personality disorder being a, a complex uh, PTSD or a complex trauma disorder. Now, uh, we have a couple of Australian authors uh, who also believe that uh, borderline personality disorder is nothing but a complex trauma disorder. Uh, given the high prevalence of uh, uh, trauma history in borderline personality disorder. Now, uh, they go on to argue that, uh, uh, so they criticize DSM for not linking uh, trauma with the diagnosis of BPD. And uh, they, uh, they argue that this actually comes in the way of uh, further understanding of borderline personality disorder and development of uh, evidence-based treatments for borderline personality disorder. So uh, that, that group uh, have actually uh, coined the name complex trauma disorder uh, instead of borderline personality disorder. Then they have published a couple of papers. And uh, there has also been a rebuttal uh, from none other than uh, Joe Paris. Joe Paris is uh, an expert on borderline personality disorder from, uh, from uh, Canada. He makes this argument that uh, uh, they wonder, however, if the assumptions uh, about etiological role of trauma obscure the complex interplay of other psychological and social determinants and risk confusing compassion with collusion. So, uh, so Joe Paris uh, clearly recognizes that uh, trauma is extremely common in borderline personality disorder and, and extremely important to work with. Uh, whether that, but 
uh, his argument is that that alone does not cause bodily impulse disorder, and there are other psychological, social, and biological determinants. So they argue that exposure to trauma is not a sufficient condition for development of bodily impulse disorder, and childhood trauma does not consistently lead to bodily impulse disorder, uh, and that genetic predisposition, temperament, chaotic families, and iatrogenic harms of unnecessary psychiatric hospitalization can all contribute to the manifestation of bodily impulse disorder in a given uh, individuals. If you look at the biology of what happens in bodily impulse disorder, we know that uh, the amygdala uh, part of the brain, which is the seat of emotions, this is where emotions are produced and emotions are regulated, that is hyperactive in bodily impulse disorder. That's been shown in multiple studies. And commonly, uh, our emotions are regulated, uh, managed by the thinking part of the brain, which we call it as the, the cortex. And the, the thinking part, the, the control of the emotion brain by the thinking brain is less active in bodily impulse disorder. So there is a poor cortical control uh, of the amygdala. Yep, that's the same point. Now it's been shown that uh, bodily, uh, in studies have shown that uh, BPD patients processing high arousal stimuli did not show cortical suppression of amygdala activity uh, even after the stimuli was removed compared to controls. So they took a group of patients with borderline pulse disorder, a group of people who did not have borderline pulse disorder. They, when they both were exposed to certain stimuli, uh, people who did not have borderline pulse disorder were, uh, were able to bring down their emotional arousal, but people with borderline pulse disorder struggled to bring down their emotional arousal. And um, further studies have been show, done to show how that is linked up with uh, amygdala. It's just an interesting fact. Uh, there is a rare genetic condition called, uh, I'm going to pronounce, I'm going to not say this name properly. Uh, it is obac with disease. It's a rare genetic disorder. There are only 300 cases have been reported globally where there is the, the amygdala on both sides of the brain is completely destroyed. That means amygdala is the one which produces a seat of emotions. Now, <coughs> now uh, what uh, the, when you study these patients, they don't seem to experience fear at all. And they have, uh, they have significant amount of bias towards trusting people. In fact, they put themselves in danger. And these people do not develop post-traumatic stress disorder. We still don't know whether these people can develop borderline personality disorder or not, but certainly these people don't seem to develop post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, now the summary is that uh, research shows that people with borderline personality disorder are statistically more likely to have altered anatomy and uh, functioning of the brain. Uh, including you know, problems in amygdala, hippocampus, and uh, there's some chemical imbalance, and also electrical activity imbalances. Now, there is another study which has uh, looked at um, how people with borderline personality disorder respond to um, photographic images uh, that have various types of emotional expressions. And uh, uh, when they were looking at the uh, photographic images of different emotional expressions, uh, they were also subjected to um, uh, fMRI, which is a kind of uh, brain imaging study which can be done uh, while, while a person is thinking or responding. Now that again showed that uh, 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 showed an hyperactivity of amygdala. Again, they looked at another part of the brain called the anterior insula part of the brain that again was found to be uh, problematic in borderline personality disorder. Uh, and we know that that part of the brain is involved in uh, uh, interpersonal cooperation. 
Now, when you look at the genetics, uh, BPD seems to be strongly genetic. Uh, and the genetic heritability effect, that is a statistical uh, concept, um, if it is 1.0, it would indicate that uh, complete heritability, all children will develop uh, BPD. But uh, what it shows is that the number is 0.69. It is quite a significant number still. We also know that uh, people with borderline personality disorder uh, report a family history of disorders and substance use disorders uh, more than uh, that would occur by chance. Now, uh, compare this uh, uh, genetic heritability effect and uh, compared with the bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, major depression, it is much more than major depression for borderline personality disorder and uh, slightly less than schizophrenia and bipolar disorders. They've also done uh, ge genetic uh, studies with uh, monozygotic and dizygotic twins. And uh, what we now believe is that uh, BPD is five times uh, more common in first degree relatives who have borderline personality disorder. Now, the, the genetics of, if you're looking at the genetic vulnerability of bodily personality disorder, it is around the same thing as that is reported for hypertension. So 50% of the reason why people develop bodily personality disorder seems to be due to uh, genetics. And we do see transgenerational patterns. I've in fact seen someone uh, having bodily personality disorder spanning across three generations. Now, childhood sexual abuse, we know that it is very, very common in BPD. Two thirds of the patients seems to have report childhood sexual abuse. And a third of the uh, BPD patients are victims of various forms of sexual abuse, sexual trauma, and often occurring multiple times. So research clearly links childhood abuse to borderline personality disorder. So uh, in another study, 85% of the people with BPD reported trauma, but about one third of the patients in some studies report uh, no uh, abuse or trauma during childhood at all. And 10% of patients report no significant childhood traumatic experience and not, not even attachment difficulties. So what is, uh, there's also controversy between what is the role of attachment difficulties and trauma and what contributes to the development of a BPD. Now, there's, one, there's a very elegant um, research that has happened. Um, uh, I'll just try and explain to you. Uh, this is an orphanage study um, in US. And um, this, uh, this was an evaluation of a number of uh, adult survivors of childhood physical abuse and uh, child sexual abuse uh, that allegedly occurred in a, a Catholic uh, orphanage in uh, New Orleans in 50s and 1950s and 60s. And um, uh, in this study, uh, it was reported that about 60% of, uh, of them were determined to have insecure attachment, mostly disorganized type. And uh, many of this uh, people came from chaotic family backgrounds and other 40% of the group came from, from large loving families where, and were likely to have secure attachment status. Uh, so despite the very different uh, backgrounds of the two groups of uh, subjects, they were all abused physically, sexually, or sometimes sadistically by the same offenders. So what really happened was in that uh, orphanage, uh, the caretakers systematically abused all children who came to that orphanage. But when you look at the characteristic of these children, um, some of them had had the uh, opportunity to have experienced secure attachments and another group did not have the opportunity to experience secure attachment. In fact, they had developed disorganized and insecure attachments. Now. So this study, uh, this orphanage study is consistent with uh, another longitudinal study called the Minnesota Longitudinal Study, uh, 
it strongly suggests that uh, clinically significant dissociative symptoms and uh, dissociative disorders, they include bodily impulse disorder, they are not a function of abuse per se, but are the result of disorganized attachment aggravated by the effects of abuse in the later adulthood. So this is the Alexander's research on women survivors of childhood sexual abuse. So what they again show is that their personal disorder diagnosis was significantly correlated with early childhood attachment. So the two separate pathways to complex trauma in adults with insecure attachment contributing to personal disorders and abuse per se contributing to PTSD. And uh, I, would, I would imagine that if it was done now, they would also include complex PTSD. So what it shows, what they, the research shows so far is that uh, childhood trauma is a significant risk factor for BPD, although it is not causally linked. Invalidating develop, uh, developmental experiences, attachment disorders seem to play an important role. So Anthony Bateman, of the MBT fame and Roy Kravitz, who is a New Zealand psychiatrist, who was also the first psychiatrist at Spectrum. So they have uh, made the statement that the biological and psycho psychological factors may be causal with each person having a unique pathway to developing bodily personality disorder. <laughs> How there's a dispute regarding the relative contribution of these two factors. So many who have experienced uh, child abuse do not develop bodily personality disorder. And many, many people with bodily personality disorder were not abused or maltreated as children. Trauma is a risk factor for BPD. Trauma is very common, but not essential for development of BPD. So trauma correlation, yes, causation, no. But trauma in the presence of biological predisposition may cause bodily personality disorder. So there's a large amount of information that is available now uh, and that the debate about nature versus nurture seems to be somewhat outdated and it needs to be replaced with nature and nurture, nature via nurture, or nurture via nature. Okay, let's quickly turn our attention to PTSD and um, borderline personality disorder. These two disorders co-occur commonly, but um, I told you that up to half of the patients with BPD have post-traumatic stress disorder and trauma can be, can, can, can be something that has happened during childhood or adulthood. Now, as you can see from this picture, so for my diagnosis of PTSD, you need these three symptoms, re-experiencing avoidance and sense of threat but you need three other symptom groups to make a diagnosis of complex PTSD. This is how you differentiate between complex PTSD and uh, PTSD. Now, so complex PTSD again, it's another way of looking at it. It's, it's to have reliving experiences, avoidance and arousal in addition to all the other uh, intimacy problems, feelings of guilt, anger, uh, relational problems, emotion, uh, regulation difficulties, or uh, feeling worthless, et cetera. But for PTSD, you only need three symptom clusters, which is reliving, avoidance, and arousal. Now, when you're looking at uh, borderline personality disorder with PTSD, uh, what are the treatments? The current practice is to try and stabilize the symptoms of borderline personality disorder first and improve the functioning and the quality of life before considering engaging in trauma-focused treatments. This was very well entrained within the dietical behavior therapy. Uh, Marshall and Han, when she proposed DBT stage one, she em emphasized that uh, trauma treatments should not happen in stage one. That should be taken up in later stages in stage two and three, et cetera. So that is the current thinking. Uh, however, that thinking is shifting now. We realize that uh, in, uh, if, if we have a group of patients who have significant trauma and borderline personality disorder, you can't postpone the treatment of trauma uh, until they're stabilized because they don't stabilize. So therefore we now have DBT uh, prolonged exposure protocols or DBT PTSD protocols where we can treat both borderline personality disorder and uh, PTSD uh, simultaneously. And in fact, we have just about started doing that at Spectrum. 
when you're looking at uh, complex PTSD, as I told you, the, uh, we don't, still don't have evidence-based treatments, but uh, DBT prolonged exposure and DBT PTSD have been tried. <coughs> Uh, there is also a new treatment coming up with the uh, mentalization-based treatment for trauma. Uh, acceptance and commitment therapy has been used. Uh, EMDR is again used, but research is lacking. And if there's some medication trials, particularly we're looking at antidepressants, the SSRIs, and cognitive behavior therapy has been tried. Of course, we also have other uh, psychodynamic and psychoanalytic uh, treatments, uh, which have been led by uh, Bessel van der Kolk and uh, Gebo Matt uh, and others. Again, uh, when, it, the, when it comes to RCTs and uh, core evidence, uh, there the, are the, the issues there. Okay, what are the uh, complex PTSD treatment principles? The obvious ones, listen, understand, uh, build a solid therapeutic relationship and validate and mentalize, that is try and understand what's happening in their own minds and in our minds and help uh, the mentalization process. And we don't want to rush, rush into exploring trauma. Uh, that needs to be led by the patient and the, the speed with which that can be explored needs to be entirely led by the patient. And at the same time, we don't want to discourage the person if they're opening up uh, and discussing trauma because sometimes we see clinicians uh, not feeling very comfortable to explore, uh, you know, uh, sit and listen to the trauma uh, history that the people uh, have to say and share. Of course, we need to develop a very a shared formulation together and we need to help the person stabilize uh, with the skills to manage emotions, relationships, uh, safety. We need to have a long-term focus, uh, especially the treatment of complex PTSD is likely to be much more longer than the standard PPD treatment. Uh, my experience, it is at least about three to five years of treatment for complex PTSD. Whereas for borderline personality disorder, moderate severity, uh, within a year, one can achieve remission. It's important to work with uh, shame and guilt, which is uh, quite common in complex PTSD, as well as self-loathing. Self-loathing is the one which seems to be very, very difficult to work with, uh, because this is a symptom which can persist for long periods of time. We need to continue to focus on recovery, recovery of, from, from relationships and work, and focus on the improving the quality of life. Minimal use of medications, if any. We need to keep an eye on general physical health. We know that uh, if someone if someone gets a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder and doesn't get treatment, uh, uh, they can have a, a significant physical health difficulties, and the lifespan can be reduced by 20 years. I believe that it will be the same for complex PTSD too. So general physical health is important. We also need to uh, work with uh, co-occurring medical and psychiatric conditions. So this is again, another pictorial way of uh, trying to capture uh, different symptom domains of complex PTSD and the different uh, potential treatment uh, approaches. I'm gonna skip this slide. This is again, another way of uh, Again, talking about different treatment approaches. We do have a few questionnaires which can be used to make a screen for complex PTSD, which is the most popular. Popular one is the, the International Trauma Questionnaire, ITQ, which is a 12 item uh, questionnaire. And this is consistent with uh, ICD 11 uh, diagnosis of uh, complex PTSD. And we also have the uh, Childhood Trauma Questionnaire, uh, the short form uh, versions. Now, so that's, as I, to, as I told you initially, there are a lot more controversies than uh, clarity. Uh, so I've presented the information that is currently available in science, but I'm, I'm almost certain that not all of you are going to agree with what is the data which is available now. And uh, some of you would feel very strongly about certain uh, views about, certain, have certain views about it. And uh, I believe that uh, they, you need to hold on to those views and uh, who knows how the science is going to shift in the next few, few years. So, however, a, a word of caution um, when it comes to advocacy. Now, be because of the lack of clarity about uh, complex trauma disorders, complex PTSD, borderline personality disorder, now there could be potential, there's a potential for splits between those who advocate for trauma and those who don't. 
uh, that can have significant impact uh, and uh, there can be confusion. Now, when that was, at least in my opinion, it was evident in the recent Royal Commission recommendations because the Royal Commission recommendation did not say a word about uh, personal disorders. Although we know that uh, personal disorders are the disorders which have been most neglected um, uh, in Victoria and across the country. Uh, however, there's a lot spoken about trauma. Uh, so would trauma recommendations concerning trauma translate to recommendations for borderline personality disorder and personality disorders? Um, the time will tell. Okay, so looking at uh, uh, the future, we are going to have a statewide trauma service in Victoria, and we will have three to four trauma practitioners in every single public mental services, as well as the local mental services. Uh, for those of you who don't know what are local mental services, uh, we are going to have 60, 60 local mental services in addition to area mental services in Victoria. And uh, we would have trauma practitioners in every single uh, uh, part of this service. We need to have develop more research uh, into treatments for complex PTSD. We also need to understand how do we differentiate PTSD, complex PTSD, and borderline personality disorder, and looking at the various permutations and combinations of these three disorders. Um, given the, the prevalence of trauma uh, being so high, uh, we really need to look at how we can prevent childhood trauma. Also, how we can start supporting and intervening, uh, 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 working with people who have childhood uh, trauma experiences. Uh, don't wait till they be, uh, grow up into adults. We really need to start working with them and their children. Uh, I know that uh, in Netherlands, they have started doing this work. Okay, so I'll stop here. So we still have about uh, half an hour to discuss and um, have questions and answers, opinions. So I'll stop here. Thanks. Thanks for listening. Over to you, Rita. Thanks, Satya. Um, I think that was a, a very comprehensive uh, overview. And as you say, it uh, potentially raises a whole lot more questions than were potentially answered. Uh, I do think that in this space, it, it's very important to, to work within whatever um, understanding that the person has about their, the development of their, their set of um, symptoms and to, to be sensitive. I also think that regardless of whether trauma is there or not, that anything should be trauma-informed, whether that be therapy or it be something like art workshops or, or anything like that. Absolutely. I, I guess, Sathya, if I may, I'd just like to to add a little bit of my, my own perspective on um, – put my own perspective on, on the debate that, that's currently out there. So it's been picked up in, in some of the questions. Um, you know, what do we actually – class as trauma? Is it an actual singular event or is it the person's experience of whatever that event is, is traumatic? And to me, often searching for a cause of the trauma can in fact be causing more harm. And I prefer to be to think of it often it, as cases of a misattunement where there's a little bit of a mismatch for whatever reason between the needs of the child and the environment that the child finds themselves in. So I just like to, to think of a child that um, is, is very difficult, it's very sensitive temperament, is difficult to feed and difficult to settle where even the most lo loving, tolerant, nurturing caregiver finds themselves unable to soothe their child and then becomes sleep deprived, may become um, very intolerant, but can be 
distress and may act in ways that do not actually align with their values. So this then increases the caregiver's distress and the child potentially becomes more fractious. And so a vicious cycle can be perpetrated. So um, this, this is a mismatch. So it just, how, um, is that a, a trauma? And I can see that that may be experienced by that the child has been traumatic. It may be a low grade stress that in fact causes the changes that you described to the amygdala and the hippocampus. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess that that's my struggle around this, this definition of the trauma. And within the current medical sense, it's very much an event, whereas from the lived experience perspective, it's an interpretation of events. You're absolutely spot on, Rita. Uh, that's the reason why I think we, uh, one of the formulation is to look at uh, uh, developing a, a very individual formulation for each person when it comes to what is trauma and uh, yeah. how the uh, the disorders can get expressed. But I'd also like to say that, and this is a, a personal perspective as well, there can be a lot of um, potential harm experienced by, by families when the clinician is seeking to find a cause of the trauma in quite an ill-informed way. And, you know, parents off, are often blamed, yet are frequently, you know, in survival mode, struggling to make some sense of what is happening in their family. And in fact, they, they may actually not be acting in line with their true values. And rather than get derision, they, they're in fact seeking some support, some understanding and some skills so that in fact they're, they're able to be in a more supportive stance with the person. Yep. Um, and I'd also like to, to consider, you know, one of the reasons for changing the, the name around, of borderline personality disorder to something else is that we know many of the uh, interactions with healthcare providers with with those with with BPD can be di can be difficult uh, you know as a carer you know, understanding what self harm is the the impulsivity um, and some of the mood swings is really really difficult and I just have an unfortunate feeling that a, a lot of um, the stigma that's surrounding that this, such I say, cluster of symptoms will follow whatever BPD is renamed to. So, yes, we get away from that term borderline, but that cluster of symptoms is still going to be there that are going to be challenging for others to understand. So I think you said somewhere, Sasya, that this needs to be a global, a global movement in the psychiatry movement, and that there is largely consensus for whichever way we go. And as a little bit of an aside, I, I'm aware of some areas where uh, a, a state health department has decided to change the, 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 the diagnosis to emotionally unstable personality disorder. And that has meant that people have been discharged from a hospital with a diagnosis of emotionally unstable personality disorder to a service that has absolutely no idea what EUPD is or how to support the person. So potentially leaving both the person and the service quite vulnerable. Um, I just might if it, anyone's got any comments or questions about that, um, got a a comment, um, a, a question here about uh, how does DID fit in with BPD and complex PTSD? And can you explain the difference between DID having alters and can this also happen with people with BPD who have severe sexual abuse? Yeah, uh, I have a very biased view about this. Um, at at Spectrum, uh, we do treat patients with uh, uh, severe DID, but we treat them as though 
they have a borderline personality disorder or a complex PTSD. Uh, and we pro we uh, work with them. Of course, we 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 work with the trauma, uh, and we work with uh, the the symptomatology they present with. We tend not to um, get excessively identify uh, and work with different uh, 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 different aspects of their identity. We go with an index identity with which they present, and our work revolves around integrating the various identities rather than uh, trying to work individually with each one of them. Um, thanks, Satya. Um, just uh, a, 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 a sorry, sorry, Satya, go ahead. Uh, I just saw another question um, from our chief psychiatrist, uh, Neil Coventry. Uh, a comment about uh, uh, the expression of uh, PTSD symptoms uh, during childhood and how we still use the same um, uh, adult expression of PTSD symptoms uh, in the diagnostic systems. So thereby we probably miss out a lot of uh, people, a uh, lot of children who would, who would, who would potentially have uh, post-traumatic stress disorders and perhaps they don't get treatment then. Uh, I, I entirely agree with your uh, with your expressed view, uh, Neil. That uh, I don't believe that we we completely understand the expression of PTSD symptoms in uh, children adequately, and certainly DSM doesn't do justice to it. Um. Thanks, Sophia. Um, there, there was a comment about um, how how old are those um, genetic studies fairly recent or are they um, a little bit outdated? So they've been around for about 10 years now, 10, 15 years. Uh, see that again about the genetics, the last word has not been said, but whatever is whatever data which is available, that clearly points. To, see, when you're talking about genetics, we're not talking about uh, if someone has a borderline personality disorder, then their uh, offsprings are going to develop borderline personality disorder off of them. No, that's not what, uh, what it is said. What it says is that what is probably inherited is a vulnerability to develop borderline personality disorder and probably an emotional system, a limbic system, which is inherited. Now, we know that uh, the, the, uh, the way we experience emotions as human beings and express emotions and regulate emotions, it varies very, very uh, significantly from person to person, culture to culture. Uh, uh, however, that in itself does not cause uh, bodily personality disorder or, or PTSD, or complex PTSD. So that coupled with uh, environmental influences. So that's what is, seems to lead to uh, bodily personality disorder. And as uh, Rita very eloquently put it, we're also looking at the uh, attunement between the two, attunement of the, the child and the vulnerability of the child and the environment. So there is a complex interplay between all of these factors. So that's what seems to result in uh, body percent disorder. Thanks, Satya. Um, there's another question about um, your definition of resilience, and I think someone else answered that as being more resilience factors versus risk factors, rather than a characteristic. That's a very interesting way of looking at it. Again, that 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 is a definition which is going to be controversial. I like the definition. Mm. Um, question here, Satya. Um, I, I noticed at the end of your presentation that you said to contact you for the slides. Are you happy to share your slides with me and I'll just send it out to everyone with the, the link to today's session? Very happy to. Okay. Um, I, I guess, are, are there any more questions? We'll, um, if you just um, raise your hand, I guess, uh, and uh, I'll ask you to unmute. Got one more question. Jimmy, Jimmy P. I can't actually hear you, Jimmy. Uh, 
Sorry, I muted myself twice. Hi, uh, <laughs> I'm working in uh, community mental health services and um, we are often working with people uh, around uh, their support uh, and building up a lot of the protective factors and, and integrating their, their um, uh, more behavioral treatments for uh, BPD and complex PTSD. And we're finding them to be quite uh, prevalent within the, our cohort that we're supporting uh, our cohort, mainly funded by the NDIS. Um, I'm wondering, uh, a lot of what's been discussed about today is from a clinical perspective, uh, but whether there's any sort of further insight that could be given around um, continued maintenance uh, that has been noted as strengthening factors for, for people who, who could, uh, you, you know, um, who are experiencing complex PTSD or, or BPD that really we should have as a, a strong forefront consideration towards our cohort? Um, let me just see if I can keep put a slide for that. Okay, so the, this, I'm sorry, I can't find the slide. So there are some long-term follow-up studies uh, says at least for borderline personality disorder, um, which shows that if you treat them early, uh, then the prognosis is better. If there is history of uh, no sexual abuse during childhood, then the prognosis is better. And, uh, and if the treatments are, so all the treatments that we have right now, we're talking about psychological treatments, such as dietical behavior therapy, mentalization-based treatment, all of them, they all are treatments which uh, can help achieve clinical remission, which means people are no longer symptomatic. They don't go to hospitals. They're not suicidal. They're not uh, harming themselves. But that doesn't mean to say that they have, uh, they have achieved complete recovery. Uh, recovery is an entirely different question. Recovery meaning having meaningful relationships, even if you go by that definition, even that definition is uh, not adequate. If you're looking at meaning, meaningful relationships and having uh, full-time paid employment. That's one of the definitions used by one of the uh, researchers. <clears throat> so we don't have treatments to achieve that. So, so we can help people to uh, not harm themselves, hurt themselves, and probably they're less distressed, but not completely recovered. Now, we know that uh, up to 60% of them can actually recover. Recovery meaning they're defined as not having any symptoms, cannot be diagnosed, and at least having a few meaningful relationships and a full-time employment. That can be achieved in, in about 10 years in 60% of the people. So it is, it's a long term. So ideally what should happen is that, uh, so if you're looking at the very, uh, this, uh, the, 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 the simplest principles of treatment of borderline personality disorder. So what do we need? Number one, we need to do some long-term work, at least for one or two years, to help them achieve remission from symptoms. That is working with, uh, with, the, with people on a weekly basis in a very collaborative way with having a shared formulation and uh, assisting with the, uh, uh, developing skills, et cetera. And that work needs to be done for one year, uh, spending at least one hour a week. Now, while that is happening, uh, they are invariably going to experience crisis. And then sometimes during that crisis, they can uh, put themselves in a harm's way. So for that, you need a crisis management. That is where the public mental services come into picture, uh, in the hospitalizations, emergency departments, etc. If you know that crisis intervention can't be done in the community setting or in family uh, settings. So once these two are things are done, uh, we need to also look at physical health because there's a 20 year reduction in lifespan. And uh, we know that people with borderline personality disorder, my guess is it'll be the same for complex PTSD too. They don't seek uh, medical help adequately. So, so that needs to be taken care of, third one. Uh, also, we need to constantly work with uh, recovery, uh, looking at relationships and uh, work. and define recovery collaboratively with families uh, and patients as to what 
what how do they see recovery as because whatever i am talking to you is recovery from a clinician's perspective a researcher's perspective that is only a perspective so that's what we're looking at perhaps uh, thank you for that. I was yeah, just more hoping that there were some sort of tips in, in terms of things that we could keep in mind uh, that are seen more commonly across the board. Um, uh, of course, yeah, definitely recognise the the individual and their um, uh, individual idea of recovery as well. Uh, just uh, I find so many times where during that 10-year uh, longevity aspect, uh, we we always want to try and make sure that we're doing better. So I thought yeah. I'd at least take the opportunity to ask a question. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jimmy, also I want to add that, uh, look, I think we have made the, the treatment of uh, uh, borderline personality disorder as a rocket science, uh, which, is, which, is, which it is not. If you're looking at DBT and MBT kind of treatment, they're very, very uh, expensive and it requires a lot of training and not all clinicians can uh, uh, learn that and deliver that. So what we are doing in Victoria is we have developed a core competencies framework. And we believe that every mental health clinician can contribute to the recovery journey of people with borderline personality disorder and perhaps also complex PTSD. So certain core skills can be learned. And we, we do a two-day training program for that at Spectrum. If you're interested, you could register for that. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Sethia. Um, Dan. Hi, Sathya. Thanks so much for your talk. Um, I'm, I'm on an inpatient adolescent unit, um, which is a place where this question of PTSD versus complex PTSD versus BPD comes alive um, for, for a range of our patients, many of our patients, in fact. Um, I'm just wondering if, if, if you have any thoughts about a systematic approach to trying to delineate and think about those diagnoses you know do we do we do the itq and something else and, and and do we kind of go through the host of the criteria with with young people to try and understand exactly where they fit in those things understanding obviously as you said the formulation is what drives understanding and treatment rather than diagnosis but also as you described there is probably some distinct treatment approaches to the three conditions. So there's probably some use, um, some clinical benefit in trying to delineate these and particularly to spare, you know, the, the people who would better fit into complex PTSD or PTSD, to spare them the kind of stigma that is attached to BPD, unfortunately, um, especially for a young person. So, and, and it, it may well all present in a much more muddled way, which we've noticed as well. It's harder to delineate, but, just wanted to flag that if you had a thought about how to approach that system. Uh, thanks, Dan, for that. That's a, that's a brilliant question. Uh, uh, as I told you, uh, if you were to purely go by science, uh, we have some information, not a whole lot of clarity. We know that uh, BPD and the complex PTSD are two different conditions, and we know that it is they can be they can be diagnosed at least if you uh, are a researcher, if you are someone who is working in the field. Now, uh, at Spectrum, from 1st of January, we will be, uh, when we get reference, we'll be either giving a diagnosis of complex PTSD or borderline personality disorder. And uh, for borderline personality disorder, we would, we would uh, uh, provide them with the same kind of uh, treatment that we provide now, which is DBT or MBT or a common factors approach, one of those treatments which are evidence-based. Now, if it is complex PTSD, we would provide treatments for uh, complex PTSD, which is similar to BPD, plus we would provide trauma treatments. So that's the difference. So if you make a diagnosis of complex PTSD, uh, you must provide trauma treatments because that, uh, uh, without that, patients are less likely to uh, recover completely. They may achieve revision, but recovery is going to be a problem. Now, in a, in a public mental uh, setting, in an adolescent unit, uh, uh, on a pragmatic level, because see the, the complex PTSD diagnosis in itself is uh, very new and the science around it is limited and the treatments around it, if you're looking at you know, population health approach kind of a treatment, that again is very limited. Uh, we, would, we are researching now, we would have the answers in the next year or two, uh, 
uh, you're aware that we're going to have a complex, I mean, uh, uh, statewide uh, trauma service. And in that context, certainly we will take up research uh, with respect to complex PTSD. And we'll have a lot more answers in the next uh, two or three years. So as of today, uh, just as a clinician, what I would do is that I'm not going to get into an argument or discussion with the, uh, with the patient. If they believe that they have experienced significant trauma, I would go by their version, whatever it is. I'll forget the, uh, what is discussed in the research for the time being. So I would work because our whole, the, the core principle in working with people with modern pressure disorder or complex PTSD is to develop a shared formulation, a shared understanding of uh, the disorder. So if trauma is, 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 the, is the conceptualization that the patient has, or the teenager has, we would want to work with that. And we won't get into a, uh, the diagnosis, a, a, a debate about the, the the name diagnosis. So that's that's because that is not uh, because if the person has the trauma formulation and if the clinician has a different formulation, it is likely to be problematic. And as Rita said, uh, with every single person, uh, every single patient, whether they have BPD or uh, complex PTSD. Uh, trauma-informed approach would certainly be uh, extremely important. If there is a complex PTSD, a clear diagnosis of complex PTSD, then we require specific trauma treatment approaches, which is the DBT PTSD protocol or MBT PTSD protocol or any of the other treatment protocols. Thanks. Uh, Sasha, uh, I noticed that John had, had his hand up and it's, uh, I'm not too sure if he still has the, the question. Yeah, yeah I'll, I can ask the question. I've got it in the chat, but uh, first, yeah, I just wanted to appreciate how you've all acknowledged what we don't know in this area. Uh, and I really value that scientific approach and looking to understand the human experience and the collective learning we get from that. Uh, because I think individually that's a journey we all take in varied degrees and different levels of consciousness on that journey. Um, however, I always question the value of any diagnosis whilst appreciating the view. Uh, when I'm thinking of that in the context of science, still understanding the human story or that, that journey collectively. Uh, so it's a bit of an oxymoron, I know, uh, but how well do we manage this in practice with our clients and between professionals? Because I think that's a real area we need to work on to get that collective learning and curiosity still happening and not getting trapped in our own cleverness, <laughs> to, so to speak. Absolutely. I think you put it very well, uh, John. Uh, I think, see, the science is there to guide us. Uh, but we don't want, and also it is incomplete. And uh, some of it is contradictory and some of it is developing. Uh, meanwhile, while we are working with people who are experiencing these, uh, these difficulties, uh, that needs to be individualized. We shouldn't become prisoners of you know, what, is, what is written in uh, research papers always. That can be a guide. And, and John, I, I really think that um, consultation with those uh, with lived experience is actually essential to progress our knowledge in this area. Definitely, um, yeah. And, and I noticed that there's been a, a couple of comments in, in the chat about that. And um, certainly from working, um, being fortunate enough to work in the lived experience panel at Spectrum, the... I really value that those insights and the understanding that we can actually develop together. Yeah, definitely. Um, it, it takes time and it's very, it's very worthwhile. Yeah. Uh, I think we've got time for one more question. If there's uh, one more question, oh, Juniper, did you want to, um, about the, um, Eurodiversity framework, how it fits in with the biopsychosocial plus BPD C complex PTSD. And some are getting an ADHD diagnosis. Uh, what's the question, Rita? Curious to ask about how neurodiversity framework 
fits in with biopsychosocial plus BPD and complex PTSD. Uh, Juniper has found many of these kinds of clients really struggle with executive dysfunction and some are getting an ADHD diagnosis. I would suggest uh, you to get in touch with uh, our, uh, one of our psychiatrists at Spectrum. Uh, his name is Dr. Lucas Cheney. He is actually uh, doing some research in this area. Um, uh, we find uh, the, the coexistence of borderline personality disorder with autism spectrum disorders uh, and ADHD uh, and other neurodevelopmental disorders. Very, very interesting. And uh, also, some of our patients who struggle the most seem to have these co-occurring uh, conditions. So we are actually interested in doing some research in this area, and we've just started doing some work. So please get in touch with it, with them, and you would have a lot more interesting conversations. And you, we, I welcome you to come and visit us at Spectrum. All right, I think we'll make the the question from Warren, the, the last one. Uh, Warren, do you want to answer that one? Uh, yeah, do you want to ask that one? So it's in the chat, Satya. Apart from trauma, are there other symptoms typically associated with BPD, such as idolization, splitting, unclear self-image, and so on, shared with complex PTSD? Uh Possibly, yes. So what I was presenting is, is the data which has been shown in research. Um, now, splitting is a very difficult uh, um, uh, aspect to study in, say, in, in, in formal research because uh, since splitting is a psychodynamic, psychoanalytic concept, um, very with the thought that the unconscious parts of oneself is split off and projected, etc. We won't go there. So what we do see is that uh, if people with borderline personality disorder are in treatment settings, we see staff uh, split into two groups often. Um, a group of them who actually like the person with borderline personality disorder and work with them, and the other, they don't. And the same thing seems to happen with, uh, for people with borderline personality disorder too. They like some a group of uh, staff and don't like uh, another group of staff. Uh, we, what we are, what we want, what we want to be very, very clear is that that should not be, that should not take a blaming approach towards the person. Even the language that the patient is splitting us, uh, we think it is wrong. We just need to notice that there are splits, and we know that the splits almost always occur along the pre-existing lines. And uh, clinicians need to take responsibility for the splits and uh, process the splits and manage. And it can be very helpful, uh, but uh, caution is not to uh, you know, take, a, take a blaming approach. Just going back to your, your original question, uh, possibly yes, but we don't, we don't know. Uh, Rita, if I could also make a comment, I think there are lots of comments in the chat box about the name bodily personality disorder. Um, as you know, Rita, I, I absolutely dislike <laughs> and despise the name bodily personality disorder. And especially calling it as a personality disorder, I have a problem. Uh, so when you call, when you say someone has a personality disorder, you're basically saying, in, however you sugarcoat it, 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 it seems to mean as though the person's character is flawed, which is not what is actually meant. Uh, we know that people experience a set of uh, difficulties and uh, mental challenges and uh, that clusters around uh, some patients. And that is, whether we, we calling it as a personality disorder, I think it is, uh, it is harmful. But unfortunately, we still stuck with that name. And uh, my, I hope in my lifetime, I would see a change um, in, in the name. And it is shifting, certainly now, we have done away with all the you know, antisocial personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, uh, all of that subclassifications are all done and dusted. In, in ICD-11 from 1st of January, we won't be using any of the subtypes, we, but still we are stuck with one single name, which is personality disorder. I guess the next step is to look at uh, how that can be changed. The problem we have is that the science has still not progressed enough 
to actually come up with a proper name. So we can call something else, but that is not going to really capture the, uh, the essence of the disorder. So that is likely to happen in the years to come, I hope. Well, thanks, Cynthia. I think we, we might wrap it up there. And I'd just like to thank everybody so much for attending today. And, um, and also, Cynthia, for your time to outline to us the, the changes that are going to be happening um, with the official launch of the ICD-11 on the 1st of January, 2022. Uh, just ask if people would um, take a moment to fill in that, that quick survey give us some, uh, a little bit of feedback on, on what sort of um, presentations you would like. And just finally, I'd like to say, I'll be sending you the, I'll be uploading this as soon as I can, and I'll, I'll send out the link and the slides as soon as possible. So thanks very much, everyone.